Greetings, Dan Halligan, and I am very excited to bring here an exhaustive playthrough. Uh, this is going to have everything and the kitchen sink and more. I basically want you to see all the elements in play. I'm going to be using different variations. There's going to be the tile sorting system. There's going to be the new scaling system, which has not been revealed to you yet. It's going to be new servants, obviously upstairs, downstairs, it's going to be drafts. There's going to be variable courtship. There's going to be the new rules associated with rotating the first player marker, although with two players, that doesn't matter. And then uh, the new rule associated with objective card retention. Everything is going to be here. This is probably going to encompass two hours. I'm going to break it up into five or six videos. I figure between now and uh, spring when we deliver the game, there will be time for people to actually want to see extreme detail. So for those who just want an overview, there are countless videos. I would direct you to the Board Game Geek page for Obsession. There's countless videos. I'd start with the John Gets Games video if you just want to see a simple straight playthrough. This is intended to be a 400 level university class as it relates to Obsession. And for those of you who have seen my playthrough videos, I, I, can, get, uh, I can get pretty ramped up when I'm doing these videos. And so, uh, enjoy or turn off as you see fit. We're going to have a two-player playthrough between York and Wessex. And one of the reasons I'm doing a two-player playthrough is to try to keep it under two hours. <laughs> but also to show that the new scaling system, which basically moves the AI to the market, and you can see there's an extension over here. And we'll get into this, and I'll bring up... Obviously, there's a lot of prototype stuff here. We'll bring up on the screen the new supply board so that you can see exactly uh, what the finished product will look like. But in a two-player game, we did the most scaling down as it relates to what we put in the market. There's, there's no more scaling down. The market itself is going to be the AI. That bag has all the tiles in it. It has backer tiles, it has hybrid tiles, it has upstairs downstairs tiles, it has obsession tiles, it has every single one, it has doubles of the f uh, prestige rating five, which was one of the stretch goals for five and six players. It's all in there, big fat bag. That's my setup, right there. No more of this, remember this, that, and the other thing. There's one little one little caveat when you initially populate, but it's a very simple one. So you're going to see that in action. And so we're going to spend a lot of time. Buckle yourself in and, and let's get started with this two-player game. Again, the two-player game is going to make the scale. It's going to challenge the scaling system uh, to the highest degree because we, we always scaled aggressively for two players so as not to clog the market and reduce the turnover so that there's good visibility to high value tiles. Other things that are going to be in play, we're going to have the new servants, we're going to have a draft, we're going to have the new rules associated with objective cards. Hold on one second while I grab my 20 sided dice because we're going to have variable courtship as well. That's one of my favorite, that's one of my favorite methods of courtship for those who have not seen variable courtship. Normally, I'm supposed to be the, the giver of gifts. I'm supposed to be the one that offers stretch goals and tries to make the project exciting for you. But I had a backer, um, goes by the board game Greek title of the Blackened Rat, and he's Rob in the comments, uh, very active from Down Under, very active in the comments of the Kickstarter. He sent me nanny narking coins because he said they were too spectacular. And I'm trying not to get a glare here. Let me turn off my little light. See if that helps or maybe turn it low. Ah, I'm going to turn it off. These coins are exquisite. So, Rob, thank you. I am delighted to get the gift. They are going to be my obsession coins. I'm sort of glad I didn't do obsession coins because how are you going to do better than Queen Victoria on those two coins imitating Pence from the previous century? 
two, two centuries ago. We're going to take a look at uh, the setup for York. Randomly dealt starter guess, good mix, mix of genders, mix of favors, that's good. Uh, we're doing the new rules associated with the objective cards. The five cards you get at setup, you retain, and then you part with one card after each courtship, and you'll see that in action. It seems as I look at these, there's a little synergy here. If I'm going hard after the animal lovers group, I'm going to have green tiles. So I'm going to, if I can make that, I'm going to, at the minimum, have 15 points in conjunction with those two. Um, let's take a look over at Wessex. Uh, for those, I should point out, for those who are maybe not familiar with the game, York's family advantage is an extra footman. Wessex family advantage is an extra tile to begin, a second level tile. I almost always pick tennis courts, so I'm challenging myself to do the breakfast room here. Um, I think I want to do the breakfast room for a couple of reasons. I could maybe get into um, some upstairs, down servant, upstairs downstairs servants, which help me out. It might help me out on an essentials courtship if I play that relatively early in the game. So challenging myself a little bit there. On their, oh, on their starter guests, we have, again, a gender mix. This is nice because no services required. Her reputation favors a little depressed based upon comparison to, to York, but not bad. Looking at the uh, objective cards for Wessex, some synergy here. This is a bonus for a lot of servants, and this gives bonus for an underbutler who would help with both objectives, obviously. And this, there's some synergy here or there. If I get that objective, I'm guaranteed, especially given that, and, and you're going to shout at me that I picked this after seeing that. I, I didn't promise. So that actually means that's going to be worth 16 points if I get that uh, objective. So some good synergy there going forward. So what was the old scaling system and why was it designed like it was? It's a point of frustration, I admit, to all those who have played Obsession. It was fiddly. I acknowledge that. It's one th reason I'm so excited about the new system. It's not fiddly. But why did it exist? It existed because as we went from two players to four players, we needed to maintain a certain scarcity for value tiles so that there was some... Um, some lively competition for those value tiles. If we had two of every copy of a tile, not only would we clog the market and affect what I call the throughput, or how often we turn over the market, or what kind of tiles that we see, um, there would certainly be no incentive or concern to buy certain tiles that we knew there was only one copy of, because there would be multiple copies of pretty much every tile. And also in the initial population, we populated the market with lower value tiles because it reflected our purchase power, if you will, our need at the time, which was our humble estates, which were in disrepair, really needed a lot of work on the basics. And the basics are those prestige rating one, two, three type tiles. So that's the reason for the initial population and for the thinning or the weeding out of certain value tiles in our original setup, but it was fiddly. I admit that. Now it's all in the bag and we're going to let the market do the weeding out of those value tiles and we're going to demonstrate it with this two-player game. What have we done? Well, you know, I'll bring up on the board here and you can see on the left-hand side the new larger obsession board is Got, has two areas where we call the uh, tile reserve. And what's going to happen is, I'll come back to live, at the end of season one, when any service tiles come into the market in season two, three, and four, they're going to flush immediately to the service tile reserve. There's a lot of logic for this. When we're third, fourth, fifth level of reputation, we're climb, we've climbed out of the, the sort of the, the doldrums and we're, and we're starting to re-enter into society with a purpose. To have a, 
I don't know, a brushing room come in here and even with its discount to be 600 pounds in season three really didn't make a lot of thematic sense. That would be something easily accessible at a, an excellent value for one of our established families by that time, that time in season three. So what's going to happen when that brushing room hits here in season three, it's gonna to flush to a reserve. What that reserve is gonna do is contain all service tiles that come into play. And this is a viable place where you can purchase those tiles. It doesn't remove them from play, but it prices them thematically and it keeps them in play. Actually, they're in play more because when you get service tiles creeping in at this end of the spectrum late in the game, they're ignored, they're an irritant. Now you can finish objectives or you can um, try to get uh, a specific service tile that can make a big difference in that last season. For example, maybe a servant's quarters in a, in a time of a servant shortage. Maybe a butler's pantry to get that under butler. So now service tiles really get used quite a bit more, but only in the first season are they coming in at somewhat of a premium. Later on, they're readily accessible down at the dollar store, if you will, the dollar, the pound store. <laughs> the same thing is going to happen with prestige rating one tiles when we get to the end of the second season. When those enter the market, we're talking things like a riding stable or a fenced paddock, and we have some new ones. We have the morning room and the retiring room, and so this becomes more important they will flush to the prestige rating one tile reserve. Be available for purchase, but be value tiles that reputable families would easily be able to do that renovation in their country estate. And as a result, particularly in season three and four, you have a market loaded with value. In addition, any duplicate tile that comes into play in the marketplace, is stacked on top of each other. So if I have in season two, let's say, I have a flower room come out and then another flower room, it stacks. What happens with the stacked flower room tiles is the person can purchase from that stack, but then it leaves the second flower room available to anybody else who would like to acquire that tile. This simple adjustment, I'm I, I, from my personal experience, greatly enhances the quality of play in the last two seasons. I'm not taking this lightly. I know there's some issues that are created by this. There's a lot of people who perhaps are not getting the second edition of Obsession are going to say, I, I'm not going to have this new player board. I'm going to figure that out. Um, I'll make sure that, that people are not disappointed in that way. I haven't quite figured that out yet, but uh, that's obviously one issue that's created. Uh, the second issue is that it's a big rule change for a game that's pretty established and doing well out in the marketplace. And so there's going to be two different ways of playing Obsession, given that this is a pretty significant change. I believe, though, that it, you know, I... I and, and trust me, I didn't do this egotistically. Michelangelo said that when he was sculpting a piece of marble, all he did was remove the superfluous pieces and expose the piece of art that was inside. I'm, I'm not. I'm not comparing myself to Michelangelo. But it feels like this change was naturally part of the game, and I just removed those superfluous pieces, which were my old system, my fiddly system. I think people will agree with me when they see it in play. So I'm sorry for that little interlude on the rationale behind the initial scaling system. Let's get playing and see the new scaling system in action. So as I indicated, my setup is put all the tiles in the bag. <laughs> the only caveat which I had mentioned earlier is that when we're populating the market for the first time, there are no tiles which are prestige rating four, five, or six that are going to be put into the market. And the servant's hall is not going to be put into the market. 
Now, I've really batted this idea around with the servant's hall. We have changed the servant's hall such that a servant must be deployed in order to take advantage of stealing reputation from a competitive player. But I still think that early in a game, a servant's hall is so devastating, even with the use of a servant, that it needs to be excluded from initial population. So my playtesting has brought me to that conclusion, particularly in a two-player game. A two-player game, when you're every turn adding one reputation to yours and taking one from a competitive player, uh, the one competitive player, that's just too much. Uh, so that is going to be one that's excluded from initial population, which means when it does present to the market, it's going to present at this end in the first season. In the second, third, and fourth season, it's going to flush to the builder's market reserve into the service tile reserve and be available for 500 pounds. It'll be a real attractive purchase. So in the old system, using the servant's hall was really depressed. And it's a great thematic tile, don't get me wrong. I know that it has the ability to upset a game. And if you don't like take that, take the darn thing out, particularly with all the new great backer service tiles, take the darn thing out. But uh, it's still a great thematic tile because gossip is the backbone. <laughs> of so many plot lines when you look back at the literature of the 19th century. So I like the Servant's Hall, I've always used it, but now if it shows up in the second, third, and fourth season, it's gonna flush to the reserve and it's gonna get used far more frequently. So let's begin. All I do is I reach into my massive bag and I'm gonna pull out a couple of tiles and evaluate them. So look at that, I got a Servant's Hall and a carriage house. So the carriage house is going to go there. I'm not going to use that servant's hall. I'll go in order. That's a four. I'm not going to use that. That's a five. I'm not going to use that. Gable conservatory is going to go there. Smoking room is going to go in there. Tennis court is going to go in there, right? Now I tend to play, um, let me put those in line. So that's a three, to, now there will be numbering system which will tell you what order competitive you know tiles of the same rating go. Uh, that's not reflected here. I'm like you waiting for the new game. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my variant, which is a service focused variant, which requires three service tiles to be in the initial builder's market. So I'm going to pull out a bunch here and see what we get. Well, look at this. We have a nice house. That's going to go there. See what else I got? I'm looking there for a service tile. And I have a servant's quarters. Wow. Servant's quarters, such a great tile. So that is our initial population. So you can see the only caveat to the scaling system is that you need to know which tiles to exclude in the initial population. Otherwise, you just fill up your bag and you go. And you'll see how that plays out over the course of this turn. 